fundamentals of face milling. Face milling is the use of a face mill to cover a larger surface area. Now there are also end mills which considered a face mill technically because it is milling a face for smaller surface areas. Most of the time when people speak of face mills they are talking about shell mills and things of that nature so let me move the end mills and we are going to cover face mills. Now this is a shell mill and it uses inserts and inserts are used all over the, the shop. They are used on a lathe, they are used on a mill and they can be replaced that way you do not have to replace the entire cutter. They have four on this particular insert, they have four edges so you can rotate this insert four different times before throwing the insert away or recycling it. With the face mill you can deck parts to thickness or rough out slots depending on how big the slot is. If this, Let's say this is a three inch cutter. If my slot is 3.05 you do not want to rough with this because you want area and room for the shell mill to finish. So you want to leave at least a hundred thou so that you can finish all the walls and start measuring before you take your final finish passes. So you can rough out slots with this, you can deck it to, to thickness or you can rough out steps. So face mills or shell mills are very handy. When it comes to your smaller, thinner work pieces, let's say you are bringing a quarter inch thickness down to size, you do not want to use a big cutter. The rule is you want to use the smallest cutter you can in order to cover the entire area. You do not want to use a four inch shell mill to deck a two inch wide part. You want to use a two inch shell mill or maybe even a half inch to an inch bigger. You do not want to take a giant shell mill and cut that because what's going to happen is it's going to wear down your inserts, it's bad for your machine, there's a lot of vibration. So we're, we're going to cover that in different projects and we're also going to be shell milling in the next uh, video or so to kind of show you guys an example. Shell mills and face mills come in different sizes so they have your larger shell mills that you can buy and they have smaller shell mills you can buy. This is a one inch and I try to buy, now this is up to you, but I try to buy uh, from the one inch and above this, this kind of cutter to where the inserts can be replaced on all the different diameters. So it, that way it uses the same insert for all the different diameters. That way I only buy one set of inserts. And I get mine from a good friend of mine uh, from latheinserts.com and he sells these kinds of cutters for your manual machines. His name is Curtis and he does a great job. But you can buy all these different cutters and all you need is the inserts and he has aluminum and steel inserts. So he has some that you can rough for aluminum and some for steel. Other than that, that should conclude our face milling principle uh, fundamentals. Next we are going to be showing examples and throughout the entire series of machining tutorials we will be having projects and in these projects you'll see a lot of face milling and a lot of shell milling, de decking parts down to thickness and things of that nature. So do not worry, we will be showing more examples later. Now in this tutorial I'm very excited because I see people do this all the time and it's driving me crazy. So I have to get this off my chest and show you guys what is happening with this part. Okay, I put blue dicum on there and I marked a line. We are going to shell mill this piece of steel down to that line. And the mistakes that I have seen in the past involves what I'm about to show you. Parallels. All right, people, for the love of God, please don't hurt yourself doing this because I see people do this and it drives me crazy. All right, they'll put their parallels in here because these are the parallels that they've they found closest to them and they'll decide to put their part in there like so. Now, if all we're doing is milling down to this line, what do you see as an issue? Well, step back and then me looking at the camera making sure you guys can see that line. If all we have to do is mill down to this line, why 
are we sticking up so far? What's going to happen is when I'm roughing, it's going to kick and it's going to smash into your cutter, throw it out of the vise, or it's not as rigid. So what's going to happen is it's barely going to kick. And when you're shell milling, you'll get a tapered part. This is a rule for everything. Hold on to as much as possible. Now you can stick it in the vise like so. But here's two mistakes whenever you just throw it in the vise without any parallels. Because most of the time you won't be able to drop it in the center because there is a gap there. If you drop it as deep as you can down into the vise, you can see you still just see the line and, and yes, you are holding on as much as possible. But there are two different problems. One is you're not centered in the vise. So Either I need another piece of steel over on the left side, that way my vise isn't unevenly gripping apart because you always want to, if you can, hold your part in, in the center. I had a guy, I told him to hold this part in the center and he was like, no man, it'll be okay because he, he couldn't get a stop to where his part would be in the, stem, the center. Well, it threw it out of the vise and killed this part. So if you can, be sure to hold your part in the center. It's a lot stronger because the center, there's only one screw holding, let me put the parallels aside, there's only one screw tightening this vise and it's in the center. If it was off to the right, then the pressure would be on the right. If it was off to the left, it'd be on the left. Well, it's not because it's in the center. So you wanna be sure to put your part in the center. It's just stronger that way. Now, because we put it in the center and it's rocking everywhere, you wanna use small parallels, the smallest you can find. And you do not want to lay the parallel sideways like this because parallels are not meant to be flat this way. They are meant to be parallel this way, not this way. So you can put your parallels in there like so and put your part in. Now I know I'm hanging up about a half inch, but I'm also gripping a lot on a lot of surface area of my part. Another good thing about using parallels is when I hit my part with a hammer, I can be sure that I'm flat on the face that I'm about to cut parallel to. Meaning that the face is flat with the parallels. So when I skim this top face, because this face is perfectly flat on the bottom, when I cut this top face, it'll also be parallel and flat as long as my head is trammed in. Now these are some small rules. That's a lot of information to kind of soak in, but it is a rule that will last through any parts that you work on from here on out. So you want to hold on to as much as you can. Try to put your part in the center of the vise because it can throw it out. You want to hold on to as much as you can, but also try to put the smallest parallel that you can under it so that whenever you hit your part down on the parallels, you know that you're sitting flat. Now you can use blue dicom or what you can do is just mic down or use your calipers to check down to the tops of the vise jaws but remember there might be a vice jaw that's taller than the back vice jaw I've had vice jaws vary 60 thou depending on who's worked on them so you want to be sure to check all these different things and make sure that you're nice tight and safe because parts getting thrown out of the vice it can be very dangerous especially if you're working in a, a manual mill department because there are no protective covers in a CNC department, if it throws it out of the vise, you're going to have the door shut and you, you know, nobody should get hurt from that. All right, we are now going to shell mill down to that line. When it comes to roughing with a shell mill, you have a few different options. For, first thing you want to do is make sure that you are trimmed in, make sure that your vise is tight, make sure that everything is nice and rigid. If it's not then you will not be able to rough your 100 thou, 150 thou. Now, I'm going to rough at 50 for, for now, and then we'll work our way to 100 thou. You also have the option, that, that was just a suggestion, the options that I was talking about, you have the option of roughing with your shell mill, or you could put an end mill in there and side mill, because with an end mill, you can rough it if it has... 750 thou worth of flute length, you can rough that 700 thou. So you can rough 700 thou down with, a, with an end mill going all the way across. But you cannot do that with a uh, shell mill. 
With the end mill, what I typically do if I have a lot of meat to rough off, I will drop my end mill down above my line, leaving enough to where I can take a couple skim passes and check everything with my shell mill. And I will side mill all the, the main meat off and then I'll come in and start skimming with my shell mill. So that is completely up to you. Just remember when you are roughing with your end mill on a manual mill, you would like, you need to conventional cut, not climb cut. So we're gonna go ahead and move our cutter and touch the top of our part. Make sure that whenever you are shell milling, because it will throw a lot of chips, that you're not throwing it towards other people. It is very inconsiderate. Nobody wants to work with you if you're doing that and you're, you're more than likely gonna get in trouble. So make sure that however the chips are being thrown that nobody's walking by or you know at least warn them because whenever you do become efficient, you should be throwing chips all the time. So let's go ahead and turn a spindle on. I'm not gonna use my quill at all. My quill is all the way up because I wanna be rigid. So I'm just gonna use my knee and bring my table up until I touch my part. Depending on your material that you're cutting, depending on how rigid you are, if your head's trimmed in, how sharp your inserts are, it depends on all of this as opposed to how much you're gonna start cutting. So I would suggest start taking 30 thou first. So I'm gonna re-zero out my knee. And we're gonna take 30 thou just to see how everything's cutting. Because with that 30 thou, I'm going to know if something does not sound right. And then I can stop it and uh, just slowly try to figure out what's going on with it. Try to nip my table a little bit. Okay, so everything sounds pretty good right there. So we're gonna take a 50 thou cut. So I'm gonna re-zero out my knee. And at this point, because we took a pass, we can now measure it. And if we had an exact dimension to go to, we could go to that dimension, leaving maybe 50 to 70 thou, so we can start taking skim passes. So I'm gonna take a 50 thou cut. Now because I'm taking a 50 thou cut, I'm gonna move to the other side of the mill. That way chips aren't getting thrown towards me. And another rule is you want to be consistent with you cranking the handle. If you do not have power feed, you need to constantly be moving the handle in the same speed. If you speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down, it's going to wear out your cutter, your finish isn't going to be as good, and your inserts are going to start chipping. Now I have not trimmed this head in, so I'm not sure if we take 100 thou how it's gonna sound. Sometimes if your belt and your head is not tight, it will stall out and it will not spin and it'll make a high squealing noise. So don't be afraid, just back off and shut the spindle off and make sure that everything's trimmed in. And if it ever does stall or crash or anything, make sure to trim your head in because it can kick the head. So we're gonna move and take another 50. And we're just going to keep doing that until we get about 10, 20 thou away from that line. take another 10 thou and at this point because I'm close to that line let's say that was my finish line I would stop measure it and then just slowly start working my way down to it and while I'm doing that I'm making sure that my parallels are sitting flat on all four corners and be sure to turn the cutter off if you're sticking your fingers under it I know I did not but to be safe you want to turn it off in case you're really pulling hard on that parallel to make sure it sticks and you accidentally slip and you hit the cutter, the cutter will win. 
So, just be careful. Now, when it comes to roughing, when, it, when you're roughing still, you do not have to use oil. If you want to use oil for your finish passes to maybe get a better finish, you can. And when it comes to aluminum, I would highly suggest using oil just so it doesn't gum up. But for still, you want to let, carbide likes it when it's hot. So you don't have to worry about putting oil or coolant on there because putting coolant on your carbide isn't always good. If you don't have a constant flow of coolant, then what's gonna happen is it's gonna heat your, your carbide up, cool it down, heat it up, cool it down, heat it up, cool it down. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna start to chip and break or at least wear down. And that's the same concept of oil. You don't wanna heat it up, cool it down, heat it up, cool it down. But for finishes, you can use oil. It, it will leave a better finish, but if you have brand new inserts and you're going the right spindle speed, then it, it'll leave a good finish anyway. Other than that, that should conclude our third fundamental tutorial on shell milling. And this is the concept that you're gonna use to deck your parts down to thickness.